Welcome to Goldfish on Games, where today we're going to be checking out the latest addition to the tech room, the Philips Video Pack G7000. The plan is we're going to clean this up, then do a few mods, and then check out some games, all the while learning what made this tick. But first things first, we've got to test it to see if it works. To test the machine, I will be using cart number one. And as there's no power switch, it has to be plugged in to be turned on. And we get a picture. The keyboard seems to work. As does the controller. This is looking pretty awesome. Which means we have to get this cleaned up. And as we can see, it's not the dirtiest machine we've had. But it is quite dusty and grimy and has quite a bit of fluff in the cart slot. And the controllers are also not in the best of shapes. And for this I'll be using the classic green hand and some glass cleaner as none of this is too ingrained or deep. So while we clean this up let's do a quick rundown of the machine. It was released by Philips and Magnavox in 1978 as the Video Pack G7000 in Europe and the Magnavox Odyssey 2 in the US. The machine might have been designed by Philips, but the hardware was made by Intel, as the CPU was the Intel 8048 clocked at 1.78 MHz, and this was paired with just 64 bytes of RAM. Graphics was provided by a custom chip also made by Intel the 8244, which had support for four sprites, background objects and a basic tile grid, and the number of colours it supports seems to differ based on the source I looked up, as I got reports of 8, 10 and 16 colours. Audio was also provided by the 8244, and featured tone as well as noise generators. And with the main machine now looking quite nice, it's time to clean up the controllers. Now one of the drawbacks of this model was the controllers were actually hardwired into the machine. And neither of these controllers are in particularly great shape, and one is significantly worse than the other. And despite looking like an analog stick, they're actually fully digital, and have the four basic directions as well as a single action button. Although on one of the controllers, the action button is held on by tape, and the other one is missing completely. And if we take a closer look, it seems someone tried to fix this up in the past with super glue and made a right mess, and ended up gluing the plunger to the plastic so it doesn't work at all. And as we need to open them up to fully clean them, we can actually see how simple the design was. Just basic membrane contacts with no real pushback for the action button which really doesn't give a satisfying press, it just feels like you're pushing against solid plastic. But we still need to fix it up, and we'll use the tiniest amount of glue to attach this button back in place. And as we finish wiping down the cables, everything is actually looking much nicer. Which means it's now time to do a few simple mods. And while I'd love to composite mod the machine, it seems that this one is harder to do than most, so instead I plan on doing two main mods. The first is to add DB9 ports to the machine so I can use any other standard Atari joystick. The other is something that was on the NTSC machine and not the PAL, and that is a power switch. As there's six wires in the joystick, it's clear to see it follows the basics. It has ground, up, down, left, right and action. So the first thing I need to do is use a multimeter to find out which colour does which action. And with guessing that black is ground, I quickly found the other wires. Now I could just add the ports directly to the case, as there seems to be cutouts for them on the back. But instead, I'm going to leave the case stock and add them to the wires instead. And with our colour guide in place, and a layout for the Atari standard pinout, I went to work. And after a few minutes, that was done and ready to test. 
which worked absolutely perfectly with my Speed King joystick. Sorry if you were expecting some detailed video of this work, but I'm not quite ready to show my soldering work to the world. If you want to see someone much better at it, please check out Reenthused and his soldering videos. The final bit for the controllers was to add the other DB9 connector to the good joystick, so I can use it as well as any other one that I've got. I also decided to follow the same plan for the power switch and added one in line with the power cable. I have about 10 games in total for the machine, so let's just check out a few to get an idea of the good, the bad and the surprisingly interesting. And let's start with cart 1, which is a complete mystery as there's no name on the cart at all. So without the book you just have to start it up and randomly press buttons till you get a game to start though more often than not, the number keys seem to be the main input method. So as far as I can tell, there's two racing games in this pack. A single player race against the clock, where you have to avoid the white cars for two minutes, and the faster you go, and the longer you go without a crash, the more points you get. The second is a two player top down racer, where you have to complete a set number of laps. There are some variations of the tracks, which can make it a little harder. The next game is Kart 4, Sea Air War and Battle. And this time we actually have the manual, but it also has the basics written on the cart, which is quite nice. And as we can tell, Sea Air War is started by using the number buttons, where you play as a sub and you have to fire missiles at the planes, all while trying to avoid the boats. The various modes mostly boil down to how the missiles work, as it can either fire to the left or right of you, and if you have limited control over the missile or not. It is quite a simple game, and it can be quite tricky to line up those shots, unless you do enable that limited control, and then it becomes quite easy. The battle game is started using the letter keys, and it is just a two player tank game. The various modes just change up the grid and add mines, but that's it, it is very, very basic. We are going to jump on to cart 10 next, which is this cardboard one, and it's golf. Which at first I thought was a little hard to play, but once you actually understand the controls, it's actually surprisingly good. You have to move your golfer around the ball very slowly, as that will determine the direction you hit the ball. And the longer you hold down the fire button, the stronger your shot. And when you land on the green, you actually get this zoomed in view, so you can sink the putt which controls in exactly the same way as the rest of the game. Now I'm not very good at it, but after a few holes I was starting to get the hang of it. And it's actually surprisingly pretty good. But the best bit, oh the best bit is when you hit a tree and the golfer throws a tantrum. The next game is number 14, Gunfighter. And it's nowhere near as fun as golf, as your goal is just to shoot the other player. Your shots will ricochet off the boulders, which can get a little hairy, but the standout bit of this game is the nicely done animations on the gunslingers. Now the last two games are actually pretty closely related to each other. First off is number 38, Munchkin, which is the video pack's take on Pac-Man. But it does have some interesting ideas. First off, there's actually only a few number of pills around the maze, and they all randomly move, so you have to keep your eye on them just as much as the ghosts. And in typical Pac-Man fashion, if you eat the flashing pills, you then get to take down the ghosts. Now you only get one life, and the goal is to rack up as much points as possible. The various modes of the game have different mazes, 
and the higher numbers even have some extra hard modes that the maze vanishes when you move, meaning you have to memorise it or stop to be able to see where you can go. All of this would have been enough for it to be a fun game, but if you press P you get this screen, which is basically an editor, and through the use of the keyboard you can add or remove vertical and horizontal walls. And when you're happy with your creation you can just hit Y and then you can play it. Being able to create your own mazes is amazing, though I wish there was a way you could return back to the editor after you tried it out. The second of these titles is 44 Crazy Chase, which at first glance looks as if it was based off the previous game, with a very similar maze setup and you playing as Munchkin, though this time he does have far more animation. The goal this time is to eat the tail of the Dratapilla, all while avoiding the Drats. You can also eat the trees for extra points, but you have to be careful as the Drats will keep coming and are not slowed down by them at all. The only way you get to take them down is for you to eat one of the segments of the Dratapilla which will turn them white for a limited time. But to be honest, it's normally quicker just to continue to munch down on the tail and try and finish off the Dratapilla as quickly as possible. So just like Munchkin, you only have one life, so it is just a basic score attack. And also just like Munchkin, there is an editor which allows you to design your own mazes. There we have it, a cleaned up and usable follow up to the world's first console. And while this might not have been the most well remembered of the second generation, it is quite interesting in its own right, and it even managed to get a few cool add-ons and upgrades, but those are stories for another time, if I happen to get my hands on them. And until next time, I was the Goldfish, that was a console with a keyboard, and this was Goldfish on Games. Thank you for watching my video, I do hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, you know what you can do with those buttons down below. Or if you're interested in munching on more content, then there's two videos on the screen right now for you to check out. Just remember to avoid the drats.